Hi there, it's Crystal Evans Hurst here, and I'm glad that you're joining us today for a community conversation. Um, I'm here because my mother, Lois Evans, had a heart for pastor's wives, not only to encourage, but to equip so that the content that is provided would um, help her to be encouraged in how she walks out everyday life and kind of keep her eye on the main thing but also to give her knowledge and understanding and information and education so that she would be able to serve um, intelligently and practically well alongside her husband. Today, we are going to be talking about leadership, how to lead others and to love it. We know that there are some natural born leaders who um, at, at as a woman, maybe in corporate world or in personal work, um, understood what it is to lead and then married their husbands who were um, leading a church and then had to figure out, now, what does it look like here? And then there are some women who never wanted to lead a soul in their lives, happy to serve and support, um, be quiet in the background and to um, share um, encouragement from the second chair and who have been thrust into positions of leadership, uh, maybe against their will. So it is possible to lead well when you're leading others, and it is possible to love it. And I know this because I have had the opportunity to connect with and engage with Miss Lori Wilhite over the years. Um, Lori Wilhite serves alongside her husband, Judd, who is the senior pastor at Central Church in Las Vegas. Uh, Central Church has more than 23 locations nationally and internationally, including 12 locations inside prisons around the country. Lori is also the founder of Leading and Loving It. This is an organization that equip, exists to equip and encourage women in leadership to love their life in ministry. And she's dedicated to encouraging pastors, wives, and women in leadership. She's also the author of several books and Bible studies. Um, she's featured in the Pastors, Wives, Ministry Bible Study, Stones of Remembrance. That's based upon the book my mother wrote. Um, if you haven't ever checked that out, you should. Lori is the proud mom of two amazing, hilarious kids, and she loves laughing until her side hurts, reading novels, cozied up under cozy blankets on the couch, and crying during episodes of antique road shows. So I'd love for you to welcome Lori to the show. Welcome, Lori. Oh, it's so good to be with you, Crystal. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. This is such an honor to get to be with you. You know, I loved and respected your mom so much. Um, for all the work that she did with pastor's wives. So it's so fun to get to be with you. Well, it's my pleasure to have you here. And um, because I just think that, you know, the knowing you kind of through different layers. So, you know, I know uh, Stephanie and Dr. Tar know you really well. They have a lot of fun with you. Of course, I know my mom was connected to you. Um, and then just me having the opportunity to come and be a part of your conference a few years back. Um the amazing thing is that I just think what you're doing is so needed. And so just the call that you felt to create something that women who love Jesus, but who are called to lead can come and be together in, because I think it's such a unique deal. Like you can go and read a lot of leadership books. You can go to a lot of leadership conferences, but leading in ministry is a, is a, you know, it's its own beast. It, there's so many layers of it. And so you've got women who are married to pastors, women who are leading and are not. And like, what does this look like to have, um, solid leadership and to be encouraged in that. And then historically and culturally, we know that women have not always been and still in some spaces aren't always championed in their leadership capacities. So what you've done through the organization Leading and Loving It is just amazing. And I want to applaud you not only for starting that and answering the call of God on your life, but also for continuing it because I know what it takes to be faithful to ministries that God calls us to. <laughs> and uh, sometimes even if you love it, uh, you need encouragement too. So I just want to encourage you to continue doing the work that God has put in your hands to do. Um, but I would love to know a little bit more about the story of how this even got started. So why did this ministry begin? You know, really this whole thing, as, as the Lord often does, <laughs> came out of really a pain point in my own life that he turned and used for purpose, right? And so when I married a pastor, I thought, oh, you know, honestly, I would have married him if he was flipping burgers somewhere because I just thought he was the best thing. But it ended up that I was kind of thrust into the world of ministry. I didn't come from a ministry family. I didn't really understand 
maybe to my benefit, I didn't understand the ministry world really. And so what I walked in with was really a lot of insecurity and a lot of fear that I wasn't going to be able to fit whatever kind of mold I had worked up in my head. Or I thought there's probably a white, a right way to do like the pastor's wife thing. And I'm not sure I know how to do it the right way. And so for the first probably maybe decade of our ministry, I just really, really struggled. And um, I was a really good faker, Crystal. I could walk in the lobby, <laughs> throw the smile on my face and just be like, everything is fine. And But I ended up in a really kind of dark season of depression for a couple of years. And as I kind of like fought my way back out of that with the help of the Lord, a great counselor and my amazing husband, and kind of got my feet back on the ground. Really what I finally had done was accept the fact that Crystal, maybe the Lord knew what he was doing when he chose me mm. to be the pastor's mm. wife. That was um, such a simple thing, but I needed to get that really down deep in my soul that even though I knew all of my mistakes and failures, God also knew, knew them and chose me anyway for the work he had for us. And so um, once I was getting healthy and doing really good again and kind of back on my feet, I thought maybe out there somewhere in the world, there's another pastor's wife like me who mm -hmm. is really struggling. And maybe they're, you know, not liking ministry right now or not liking leadership, or maybe they're loathing it. I went through a season like that, but wouldn't it be great if we all really loved what God has put before us and, and enjoyed the opportunity of getting to serve him in this way. So I, what started as like a very tiny, poorly written little blog 16 years ago, back in the day, um, has blossomed into what we, what we have the privilege to get to do today, which is really walk alongside leaders and um, hopefully helping them become even healthier versions of themselves because we know that creates healthier ministries, but also help really equip them for whatever role God has called them to in their own churches. So, um, you know, I'm just really thankful. I wouldn't wish what I walked through on anyone, but I'm so yeah. thankful that um, the Lord has pulled it around and redeemed it and now is, you know, using it. I love that. That's what he does so well. Now, currently, can you describe for me and describe for us what your role is? Just give, and I'm, I'm sure there, there are, you know, there's an A, B, and C level here. There's like probably a few hats or um, I'd love to know what, what your current role of leadership is mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and how that maybe has evolved over the years. Yeah. I mean, I usually say I have three kind of different spheres. I have leading and loving it that I founded, that I run. Um, it's kind of my day-to-day -day job, um, trying to love on ministry leaders and pastor's wives. Two, I am the senior pastor's wife of a church. So I we have a beautiful staff and our church family that we love so much. I call myself the head cheerleader of Central. I walk around and give all the hugs and all the high fives and tell our volunteers they're the best volunteers that have ever volunteered in the history of volunteering. And uh, <laughs> I have a special like love for our staff children, for our staff kids. And so I spent a lot of time loving on our staff kiddos. And then I also do writing and speaking and all of that kind of stuff as well. So kind of have my hands in a lot of things, but, um, you know, hopefully all pointing toward helping people, whether they're in leadership or they're sitting in the, you know, rows of my church, find strength, freedom, and joy in who God has created them to be. I love that. I love that. Do you find that, you know, because one of the things that I know that it's always going to be a struggle when, particularly when you're talking about pastor's wives is the, the multi wearing of the hats, you know, um, right. even if these are places where you should be and they're places where you want to be. And especially if there are places where your husband is desiring you to be the balancing of those roles. So I'd love to start out by just talking about that. Like we all have 24 hours in a day. And being in a leadership role typically means that, you know, especially if you've um, grown up in a church, so to speak, um, there is a point at which every time you get elevated to a new level of leadership, there's something that you have been doing hands on or in a certain way that you have to relinquish so that you're able to do 
at another level what you're now needing to do. And so I'm, I'm curious about the vertical and horizontal of, mm -hmm. of this question. So horizontally, you've got three different hats. How do you balance it? And then vertically, like how have you managed downloading, delegating um, so that you're able to balance because you can't do it all probably the way you used to do it. So can you kind of walk us through the balancing act and how you, through the varying levels of leadership as you're elevated, how you keep the main thing, the main thing? Sure. You know, balancing is, it's such a, you know, it's not quite as easy as like, um, saying a third of my time is here and a third of my time is here and a third here. And so everything is perfectly balanced. It's more like, you know, those BOSU balls that you work out with that are like the, the ones that are the half that you stand uh -huh. on and you have to go. It is a little bit more like that where you have to shift your weight here for a little while. Then you've got to shift, shift back around to another place. So there's, you know, right now we're heading into Easter, such an exciting time for the church. The bulk of my my shifting is into my role as the senior pastor's wife. i be doing a lot of church things um, in the next week. And when we kind of pull through Easter and things start to calm down, I'll shift over and I'll spend more time with some leading and loving it stuff we have coming up. So some of it is getting down the art of shifting your weight mm. and shifting your schedule to where it's needed um, the most at a time. And even though that doesn't like on paper seem balanced, it actually makes you feel balanced to be mm. able to shift kind of where you're needed at the moment. And so, and then there's seasons when I'm writing or something like that, that I shift a little bit more that direction. And so that has been a little bit of a skill that I've had to learn over the last 27 years in ministry, but, but, um, understanding that not everything is going to have the same amount of attention and that that yeah. actually is not just okay, but it's good to be able to give myself permission to lean a little more fully into one of those hats um, in a given season that has been really helpful and freed me up to not have to like feel guilty or feel, you know, I can just really embrace that season for what it is and lean into it like I need to. And, you know, you're totally right. You have to have some people around you, whether they're um, it's your family or your friends or your volunteers, maybe, or a, a staff team or whatever you've got kind of at your disposal that the Lord has gifted you with um, to kind of help carry that burden and uh, be able to get a lot of things done. I, for me, Crystal, I will say delegation has not come easily or naturally. I'm one of those people that <laughs> has a very set vision for how I want to do something. So sometimes it's a little hard to pull my fingers off of it and let people, um, you know, really flourish in something. But it has certainly helped to get out of the way and not become a lid of leadership over um, any area of my life to kind of remove myself as the lid and let other people let God flourish through their work and their passion. And, mm -hmm. and um, we've actually done so much more and so much better than if I have had to try to control everything from the top, getting out of the way really allows that to happen. But that's been, again, a learning process for me over a long period of time. I love that. That's so good. So useful. And the BOSU ball, we have a love-hate relationship with that thing, don't we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Okay. We often hear pastor's wives say, I don't feel qualified. Or they say they feel like an imposter in their role. And you kind of alluded to that, just kind of faking it a little bit. So if you were going to speak to a pastor's wife with practically how to move forward in confidence, um, whether or not she feels qualified and to reject that imposter in the role, like, can you walk us through a little bit of how you were able to overcome um, yeah. those feelings? Yes. Well, first, let me say to everyone who feels like that, welcome to the club. You are not alone. Welcome. Everybody has those moments. Some of us have decades of that. And so you are not alone in feeling that way. So many of us have those same kind of internal struggles and battles. Um, for me, I remember uh, years and years ago, probably 15 years ago, I was having that moment, you know, that kind of Moses at the burning bush moment where you're just like, 
oh, there's so many people who are better than me. Don't you want to send somebody else, God? Like, I'm not good enough. I'm not, my voice isn't powerful. Like, I had that kind of moment of um, just really believing, if I'm honest, really wondering if God had made a mistake with me. Mm. My husband was extremely called to ministry um, with every fiber of my being. I knew he was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. My fear was that God had made a mistake with me. Um, Mm. And I was having this moment with a friend. We were standing in line for TSA at the Miami airport where apparently all spiritual things happen right there. In the <laughs> and I'm having that moment with her and I'm kind of like lamenting like, Oh no, what if the Lord messed up? And which is such a silly thing to say, but it, it was kind of how I felt in the moment. Yeah, how you And feel? she put her bags down and she turned around to me and put her hands on my shoulders. And she said, Lori, I really just have one question for you. Do you believe God's sovereign or not? And I was like, well, Yeah, I've been in church my whole life. Yes, that's a very easy church answer for me. God is sovereign. And she said, then I have to ask you, do you think God did not know what he was doing when he chose you to be Judd's wife? Do you think he didn't know what he was doing um, when he chose you to be your kid's mom? Do you think he didn't know who Mm -hmm. your church needed to be the pastor's wife? So do you actually believe he's sovereign or not? And I actually, in the moment, told her, I'm going to have to think about it a little bit. I'm going to have to think about it (laughs) because that just was such a more personalized answer. I think we have those moments, right? Where we look around at our church members or our friends or our family, and we believe God is sovereign in all of their lives. But if we're honest, when we look at our own, we just have all these insecurities and question marks that rise up. So I did take like legitimately a week or two. And really, really process. Do I believe that for myself with my weaknesses and my shortcomings and my mistakes, do I really believe that God knew what he was doing when he chose me? And once I got to that yes in my life and really pulled that deep into my heart, that started to change everything. Now, it doesn't really matter if you're insecure or not because God has chosen you. It doesn't matter Mm -hmm. um, the fears that you may have because God has commissioned you to do the call on your life. And it really transformed everything for me. Um, And while I didn't have like instant confidence, it really, all of those kind of things that had held me back started shrinking and um, that confidence started growing. So it, it definitely took place over time, but I do think it is the hinge point question for those of us who are having some of those struggles of feeling like, I'm just not equipped enough for this, or I don't know enough, and I don't have the whole Bible memorized, or whatever our like personal insecurities are. I think the question we all <laughs> because you have to have the whole Bible memorized if you're a pastor. Of course you do. Um, you know, and but I think that's the question we need to really ask ourselves: is do I, at the core of my being, believe that God knows mm-hmm. what He's doing with me? Yeah. And then if that's a yes, yeah. then confidence will grow out of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. That's so good. So good. Um, when you are leading, particularly in church, you are constantly battling what you're, what you feel led to do mm-hmm. versus what other people think you're led to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I think that that is a blanket approach for leadership because mm-hmm. people have their idea of what you should do as a leader. But I think, again, it's my opinion that everything in church is in the world, but it has layers. We have our own layers, our own expectations. It's like being a pastor's wife. Of course, every wife has to work through certain things. But then being a pastor's wife just brings extra layers of things. And so um, when you're a pastor's wife, you have the layer of other people's expectations. Um, Their expectations because of the pastor's wife they grew up with, Mm -hmm. their expectations of the pastor's wife who was here before you and your husband got to this church, their expectations of um, putting you on a pedestal. And so when you're balancing other people's expectations, not only as a leader, but also as a pastor's wife, Mm -hmm. how do you keep clear on what God has called you to do? Well, it's a great question because we all have it, right? Like that, the expectations of past generations where you had to like play the piano, run the children's choir, (laughs) 
and you know like have the perfect house at all times because you might be hosting 50 people at, at a moment's notice have kind of given way to the expectations of today where you have to like know everything be it everywhere like teach all the women's bible studies you have to um, be it all the baby showers right it's different expectations than previous generations and it can be um daunting it can be daunting because you have your family that you need to take care of and and what God has put before you, the passions he's planted in your heart and the purpose he's planted there and a responsibility to, you know, pursue that um, all at the same time with dealing with the expectation. And the truth is as many expectations of other people that we struggle with, we probably have a lot of expectations of ourselves too, that are not, Correct. um, really grounded in the truth of the Lord, right? There are things that we've <laughs> drummed up in my head. When I became a, a senior pastor's wife or pastor's wife years ago, the only pastor's wife I really had in my head was the pastor's wife from Footloose. Do you remember back in the day Footloose? And she had her like <laughs> sad little skirt and her sad little bun. And, and she just looked sad all the time. And I was like, I'm going to be terrible at this. If this is what it, this role requires, I'm going to be terrible at this. And so we all have that for ourselves. We have it from other people. Um, and for a long time, I really struggled under the weight of those expectations. I had a couple of pastors very early on, even before we um, got married and we were engaged, pull me into their office. And one told me I, I shouldn't be a pastor's wife because I did not have the right personality for it. Oh, wow. And um, which is... A hard thing to hear and absorb <laughs> as a 20, 21 year old girl that, you know, what you feel like this man that you love that God has placed in your life. Now you are actually not, um, don't have what it takes to be able to, uh, you know, come alongside him. And the other one told me that I just was frankly too much. He was like, your too muchness is going to hurt Judd and hurt his ministry. So it was a lot for me to take in in the moment. And I think they were doing exactly what you're talking about. They were coming in with their own expectations for what that role should look like. And I did not fit the image in their minds. And so I just tried to almost retrofit myself into that box. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, it wasn't the box God ever asked me to fit in, mm -hmm. but I tried to fit in this little man-made thing. And what ended up happening is it felt much like a cage, uh, a little prison cell that I built for myself using the expectations of other people, the expectations I had for myself. And um, when I was able to break free of that and just realize that my number one responsibility as a follower of Jesus, as a daughter of, of the King, is to follow what the Lord has placed before me. Uh, my yeah. first job is to walk in obedience and pursue the purpose that he has for me, specifically tailored for me. Um, it won't look like every pastor's wife out there. My, our church doesn't look like every church out there, right? Every church is different. Every church community is different. And it requires a different kind of leader and pastor's wife at each community. And so I don't have to yeah. have a box that I fit in. And I don't have to do it like A, B, and C, name the amazing people out there. Um, I need to do it the way God has equipped me to do it. I need to use my personality that was created on purpose um, and use it in my role. And so it was honestly, for me, it was really breaking out of the prison of expectations. And then I had such freedom to start to pursue what God put before me. Um, and it was a, an absolute game changer. I felt so much more purposeful. Um, and I think God was able to use me in such uh, more impactful ways when I was really leaning into the way he created me and what he had set before me, instead of trying to constantly be someone who I wasn't and trying to fit into yeah. boxes that I shouldn't have been fitting in all along. So my encouragement to anybody in that same seat would be, man, we're going to disappoint some people. Sometimes we're going to disappoint some people. And that's, 
you know, a bummer. But what would be way bigger of a bummer is to miss out on what God has actually called you to do. So don't miss that. It's okay if not everybody loves it. It's okay if they don't love your personality or think you're too much. Just embrace who God has created you to be. Pursue the purpose that he has before you and do it with freedom and joy. And um, I know he'll use it in really powerful ways. Well, one of the things um, I know that we people will struggle with is what are my gifts? If, if I don't teach, if I'm not an event planner, if I'm not a natural born, born leader, if I'm not playing the piano, if I'm not singing, I hear you saying to embrace your unique style, but how do I discover it? Yes. Well, that's a great question. I, I actually have like this, um, process that I personally go through. In fact, if you're, you're interested, I think it's on my, uh, website, lauriewilhite.com. You can pop over there and it says maybe chase your purpose or pursue your purpose, but you can download that and kind of go through the process I go through. Um, anytime I'm kind of having those questions come up in my own life of like, what do I need to do? And I literally will go through like, who has the Lord put in my life that needs me to use the, my pain for a purpose that is walking through what I've already walked through. Like, who is that? I need to fall in love with that person really deeply because the Lord has now equipped me to be able to help them. And then I go through like, what can I do to make an impact in their lives? What can I do to um, bring encouragement and hope to them? And then how can the Lord use me to make an impact in his kingdom? So I kind of walk through this multi-step process and um, it, it with a lot of prayer and a lot of seeking God, um, let him kind of bubble that up to the surface. And then once I know that I just go after it in a really, um, you know, intentional, um, but excited way, because I feel like that that is, um, who the Lord has been writing my story to be able to hopefully impact theirs as well. So that might be a, a resource that could help somebody that's wanting to figure that out. I love that. Thanks for sharing that with us. Okay, let's talk about some of uh, the reasons that pastor's wives are not loving their leadership duties. Okay, so they've been hurt. You talked a little bit about your own experience there. Um, pastor's wives are just like everybody else, humans with feelings and emotions. Um, but when leadership comes with wounding, you walked through yeah. your process a little bit. But when someone comes to you and says, listen, I want to honor God. Um, I'm either aware of my gifts or I'm willing to do the work to discover my gifts, but I am still wounded. Can you tell us a little bit more, either from your own experience of what you've seen other women do that plugs those holes so that they're able to get back to operating? Because I think one of the things that for pastor's wives and also just in ministry in general, we will lead and work wounded because... Jesus did it. You know what I'm saying? Like he went to the cross, he carried his own cross. They put the crown of the, so we, we of course are willing to do hard things to engage in suffering, but sometimes that's counterproductive. And so when you, have, when you are seeing a woman who's wounded, who's charging ahead or a woman who's wounded. So she's a wallflower. She's just, she's out. Um, what is the counsel that you are going to give to a woman who is needing to lead, needing to operate in her giftings, but is not doing that in a healthy way? Right yeah. Well, all of us are going to get hurt. 100% of us at some point in time <laughs> are going to experience some hurt. The, it doesn't have to, though, hold us back. Um, we don't have to live in it. That Living in it is a choice. And so it's really having the courage to seek some healing and to let some people in, which I personally think a lot of that comes from obviously your connection with the Lord, but it's also a counselor, which I think everybody should should have one on speed dial, <laughs> have somebody that you can talk to that will give you some spiritual pushback um, and really try to help you stay on the healthy side of things. And, um, and then a community of people, which let's be real as leaders, that is so, so hard. The number of people you can talk to is, um, sometimes it feels like the answer is no one, which is a little bit scary of an answer, but it takes a lot of intentionality to build up a community like that. But even with all of that, we still have a lot of hurts. I remember years ago, my husband was really, really just struggling. I think just 30 years of ministry, he had almost like, if he was carrying around a backpack and had been stuffed full of 
you know, things people had said or people that had left or betrayals that had happened. And he met with his therapist and he said, Judd, I want you to write down literally a list of the names of all the people who have hurt you. Not like little wimpy hurts, like they didn't like your hair or something, but like, yeah. but like yeah. real ones actual. That stung. And yeah. so Judd's like, oh my gosh, this list is going to be hundreds of people. This is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be gnarly. And um, so he wrote it down and he brought it back the next week. And he was like, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you that there's only like 10 people on this list. And his therapist smiled and said, it's always 10 people or eight people or 12 people. It's not as many as you think, because we mm. have a tendency of people to let the words and actions of a very few people hurt us in such a way that then we project that on to the other people that we're called to minister to. And instead of being like focused on, look at this 98% of people who have been so kind to us and good to us. And the Lord has moved so powerfully in their lives. We focus our attention on these six, eight, 10 people and um, let them frankly take the calling from our lives or at least the mm. joy that we have in our calling. And um, it's a real tension point for us. I think I read a stat a long time ago about the average person in ministry leaves because of the words and actions of eight people, which mm. shows you one, how damaging eight people can be. Yeah. Which, yeah. I, I think it's really convicting that we are willing to, to release the call of God on our lives because of eight people, eight people. And so I have just been personally really convicted in my 27 years of ministry that when I have those, one of those eight people show up in my life yeah. um, with maybe some hurtful words or, you know, stabbed us in the back or whatever it was, um, like, like I have to literally sit myself down and say, I will not let them take the call of mm. God from my life. And I will not let them have the joy that I have in my calling. And so, um, and then I just try hard to refocus my attention on all the beautiful people that God has allowed us to minister to and um, focus on how God is moving in their lives. And it helps offset that. It doesn't make it go away, but it helps me cling to a lot of hope instead of clinging to the hurt and really driving that down into my soul. And so um, I think it's the way it's the way to stay in ministry a long time, mm. um, keeping our eyes and our focus on the hope instead of just the hurt. We're going to have it. We're all going to have it. Um, the disciples had it. Like when they were starting the first church in Acts, it says something like, and as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. These were the guys who walked with Jesus that led the church with right. rumblings of discontent. Like, thank <laughs> because so do I. And so do you, like we all have that going on in our church. And if, if the guys who hung out with Jesus all the time did, then I feel very encouraged. And so we have them. We all have them. Um, I think it's just making really concerted effort to stay healthy, to have the community around you that you need to get a counselor in your life, to keep seeking the Lord and to keep clinging to the calling he has on your life and not be willing to let somebody else take that from you. That's so good. So good. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there's so many things that you've said that speak to one of the other questions I had. It's like keeping your joy. But I think the issue is focus. Like if you're focused on not the few that are tearing you down or being negative, but what God's call is on your life. I think that's what keeps you invigorated is a matter of, is a matter of focus. And so if you're listening and you don't have joy, yes, ministry is hard. Yes, you will get hurt, but you get to choose what you're going to focus on and not allow the small things to turn into huge things unnecessarily. Um, you know, I, I know we talked about balance at the beginning. I would love for you to just maybe speak to specifically the women who are in the season of life where they have children that are maybe younger. I know that as children get older, even though I think they need us differently and more in other ways, there is that season. And you know that well, when your children are small and there are the pull, there's the pull, not only of the church and what the church wants you to do. There's not only the pull of how your husband wants you to support him. There's not only the pull of what you want to do, you know, 
But then there's the reality of the need that these small children have for me to be available in a different way. So could you just speak kind of a word of encouragement to, to women who are mothering and in that heavy season of mothering, when they feel like the opportunities to lead, the opportunities to grow, the opportunities to do what they feel like they should be doing, what their husband wants them to do, what other people want them to do, what they want to do is passing them by. Yeah, absolutely. I, and again, welcome to the club. You are not alone in feeling this way. We all have been there. I remember I went to a conference, it was right after I became a senior pastor's wife. And the temptation for us is we can look around at other leaders and start to compare ourselves. And I don't know, we always end up on the losing end of that, right? <laughs> always, always. Like discontent in our own lives. But I was around all these incredible women who were like, you know, I'm homeschooling 12 children and I'm leading everything at church. And I was like, well, super. I showed up at church with matching shoes today and I felt like pretty good about it because I had <laughs> two tiny babies. And if my hair was washed and I showed up, I felt like I was in like pretty good shape. And so there are seasons of life where that is just it. When you're running, chasing toddlers and and changing diapers and teaching ABCs at home and trying to make sure somebody eats a vegetable at some point, then, you know, that is a beautiful season of life and it's going to go by really quickly. And the opportunities that you have now, they will show back up. They will absolutely mm. show back up. Uh, you can say not now, knowing that the Lord will give you opportunities later. So, and as your kids grow, you're able to do different things things. Now my kids are both in their twenties and, um, I'm able to do very different things. I still probably need to make sure my shoes match before I run to church, but, <laughs> but my life is very different than it was 20 years ago. Um, when we were like hashing it out in ministry. So just as a word of encouragement, just enjoy the season that you're in. Um, you do not need to be in all the things. You do not need to be with all of the people. You need to be the best mom you can be right now and the best encouragement you can be to your husband. Um, your time will come where things are a yes. little bit different. Your season, your kids are sleeping through the night or whatever it is, um, or they're in school and you've got a little bit more ability to do some things around the church. Th those seasons will come. But when you're in the mix of that, that, that crazy season with littles, where it is a little consuming in all the best ways, um, just, <laughs> enjoy it. just enjoy it. Like what a ministry God has before you right now, the most important ministry of our lives. And so enjoy it, lean into it. Um, those ministry opportunities and those leadership opportunities will be there. You will have the opportunity for that. Enjoy the season God has you in now and um, and then be excited and prepared. It's really in some ways from a leadership perspective, a little bit of a waiting season, waiting for a little bit freer schedule or a little bit more um, energy or whatever it is that you need. And there's a lot you can do in a waiting season, a lot of you know, preparation that the Lord can do in your heart. He, there's a lot of healing that can happen. So you're the healthiest leader you can be when the time comes. There's a lot of prayer and seeking God and asking him to just mold your character into who he needs. And so there's so much that can be done while you're rocking your baby and letting God just prepare your heart for the next season. But I say for now, just enjoy it. Just soak it in and let God, um, use this time powerfully for your kids, but let him use it as a preparatory time for you as well. That's so good. That's so, so good. Well, I know that you, um, any leader wants to be resourced. So even if they're providing resources, they want to be resourced. And I'm sure in your own leadership journey, there have been um, lots of things that you were so grateful that you had, whether it was a mentor or a book or a conference but I would love to ask you, what resources are you providing right now to pastors, wives, and women in leadership through Leading and Loving It? And how can women learn more? Oh, thank you so much. Um, we are doing a lot of things over at Leading and Loving It, but two that I'm really excited about right now that we have coming up um, in the near future. First, we do have a conference that we have every year. Crystal came to that. It's been a, it's been a hot minute. Um, and so we have that every October. And it's just such a great 
time to get to be together. It's a we meet in Vegas, but there's also a virtual kind of component to it too. If you aren't able to travel, although I think everybody should grab a friend and have a little Vegas trip. And you know, Jesus is alive in Vegas, guys. So don't be worried about it. And so um, it's a great, <laughs> wonderful, encouraging time together that is extremely focused on ministry people. And so I'm very excited about that. That is October, I think 22nd and 23rd. And I'm really, really, all the planning is going right now. I like our speakers are incredible. I'm so excited for um, what's coming up. So that's going to be Revive. It's our annual conference. I'm super excited about that. We would love to have you there. And then we do have a almost like a community of, for really growth minded leaders called Together. And it's really just a monthly opportunity for leaders to get. Um, really poured into to grab the tools that we need for leadership, whether that's, you know, really getting like we've talked about on the healthy side of ourselves and our own hearts and our minds and our emotions so that we can be the healthiest leaders that we need to be. Or if we need really practical tools um, for leadership, we do both of those things and we do it monthly and together reopens in April. It isn't open all the time to pull people into that community, but it is open in April. So you can jump in there and meet some great people. I say, I think every ministry leader needs a little bit of a girl gang in their lives to circle up with. <laughs> it's a good opportunity to find those gals and to get to meet some other ministry leaders and then hopefully really equip you for what God has put before you. So you can find uh, all the information about those things at leadingandlovingit.com or reach out to me on Instagram, DM me. I will be happy to answer any questions, but we would love to come alongside you, serve you, um, just help you as you pursue the purpose that God has before you. And um, it's just, it would be an honor. That's so amazing. I, I'm curious. I want to ask you one other thing, and I've kind of mentioned it, but I would love to it's so amazing that you're providing resources, but I always like to ask people, how did you learn? And sometimes it's the school of hard knocks and often it's the word and the Holy Spirit. But who was mentoring you or what books did you love that helped you or what events did you go to that filled you up? Even if they no longer exist, I'm curious as a leader, leading yeah. other people, leading organizations and developing, what fueled you before you went and created something to fuel other people yeah. in this role? Um, it's a great question because I feel like so many people will ask me, like, I just need to find a mentor. I need to find a mentor. And I think what they mean is like, I want to go have coffee with somebody once a week and like have them mentor me up. But I, <laughs> I don't think that's the only way to have a mentor. My mentors, especially early on in ministry, I didn't know them. I um, was not connected with them, but they poured into me a ton. One of those was Kay Warren. Long before I met her, I do know her now. She's lovely. Um, she had, now, Crystal, you got to go back with me. You got to go back before, you know, social media. Like she had CDs and yes. she had like a set of like 12 CDs for pastors wise. And I wore them out. <laughs> I listened to them over and over and over because I had been tricked, I think tricked by the enemy into thinking I'm the only one. I'm the only one that struggles. I'm the only one that has fear. I'm the only one, which is such a lie. And she was so honest in them. And I was like, I need to just, I just listened to them over and over and over again. And so I, the like modern day translation of that for me is, man, there's so many wonderful people out there doing amazing things. You guys and this ministry is incredible. Um, you are mentoring so many women through this. And so they don't have to sit and have, um, you know, across the table from you at a coffee shop, but this is just as powerful. And the wisdom that you share and so many other ministry leaders share, it's so um, really at the at our fingertips if we want it and to be able to grab a hold of it podcasts, books, so many things. Um, my encouragement is just find somebody that you respect 
They, they have walked with integrity with the Lord. There's too many people in ministry not doing that. And so yeah. find the ones who are like leading beautifully, who are loving their people, who are leading with integrity. And then, man, go to school on them, follow them on social media, buy their CDs, like whatever it is, like really soak in the content they have and see what the Lord can teach you through their leadership in their lives. And um, I think that could be a really powerful way to be mentored from afar by some pretty amazing people. I love that. I love it. And I love the fact that you're demystifying this because if people think I can't do what God has called me to do, unless I go to coffee with somebody every week, and unless they give me step by step what to do every step of the way, listen, even if you find that people are people and they're going to disappoint you. Like, you know, <laughs> so I love how you just said, get the CD or, you know, at this point, do watch it. them on social media or YouTube or whatever. That's this great. has been so great, Lori. I'm just so grateful that you have availed yourself through your pain, through your experience and through your own area of need to so many women who I know are blessed. And as those women who are leading are blessed and go back to their churches where they're serving, where they're connecting with others, then those people are blessed. People who will never meet you, but are getting the overflow of what God has called you to do. So thank you for being faithful to what God has called you to do and to being willing to let him use your pain in a way that has purpose and for being willing to join me today and share so passionately about this calling on God's life for you. That is also um, a calling on God's life for so many others. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have been so enjoyed the time. Let's just all go out there and get it. Let's just follow the Lord go get it. <laughs> and uh, make a difference. Thank you so much, Crystal. You're welcome. You're welcome. Y'all, that conversation was great. I hope if you're leading in your church, you're encouraged. I hope you're reminded that you're not alone. I hope you are challenged to grow and to take advantage of the resources. Um, again, we shared Lori's website um, with a resource that she mentioned for discovering your gifts. She talked about her uh, the, the conference that she puts on with Leading and Loving It. She talked about the together groups for growth-minded individuals. I mean, there are resources available. And I know that you may be working a full-time job and serving in a ministry. I know that you may be running behind toddlers and trying to show up on Sunday. And maybe you do play the piano and sing on the praise team. Um, but I want you to know that there are resources that you can listen to while you're in the car on the way to church. And then there are books to read when you've got 15 minutes waiting on a kid to finish soccer, or there are people who volunteer their time like Lori has done to join us today to share with you what they've learned. There are resources available. Why? Because there are women who get it. There are women who've been where you've been. They've had to serve in the spaces where you've served. They have a passion for teaching other women. Even when Lori mentioned the CD set by Kay Warren, it's because Miss Kay knew what she had been through as a pastor's wife and said, let me put something on a CD so I can teach some women and encourage some women. And as long as we keep, even through our own pain, even through our own experience, and even through our own imposter syndrome, and am I supposed to be here? As long as we're willing to teach what we've learned, we can up close or even from far away um, lend our experience and be willing to mentor other women. So you've received mentoring today from an amazing pastor's wife, Miss Lori Wilhite, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Now, I want you to know that the Pastor's Wives Ministry is here to continue to bring pastor's wives to you um, and content to you that if you're a pastor's wife will help you to be encouraged and equipped where you are living and serving. We already know that if you're watching this content and you're not a pastor's wife, that you're blessed too because we already know this is how it goes. It's the overflow effect. But we want you to know that the Pastor's Wives Ministry as a whole is here to serve you. So the first thing that you want to do if you're not already in the Pastor's Wives Facebook group is go to loisevans.org forward slash Facebook group so that you can network with other pastor's wives. You just need to know who's in your city. You need to know what another wise woman would do. You need to ask other women who understand the pastor's wives life to pray for you. That is what the Facebook group is all about so that you can connect with women who know your story or at least their version of your story, but you have a shared experience because you are not alone. The second thing we want to make sure that you are aware of is that there is a devotional that we make available 
um, through the urban alternative and how we want to continue to serve women. And so if you're a pastor's wife, even if you aren't, if you're in leadership, this is going to bless you. And it's something that if your pastor's wife is a great tool for you to share with the women of your church, you can sign up for the devotional by going to tonyevans.org forward slash her Devo. And then you can subscribe to that. You can get that via email or you can text her Devo to 55659 um, because it's really uh, content that Priscilla and I, we are writing every month to encourage women specifically in the areas in which we live. So again, if you're looking for encouragement, if you're looking to pass on devotional encouragement, Priscilla and I would love for you to get your hands on that devotional. And the last thing we want to encourage you to do, uh, if you are in your local church serving in ministry, especially if you are a pastor's wife and you are looking for content uh, for your women at your church, maybe you are leading your women's ministry or you give vision to the woman who is leading your women's ministry. We realize that everybody can't put on a church conference and we love our church conference. And because of COVID, we gave everyone a taste of how we do things at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, which is our home church. Um, and our women's conference, which will be 20 years old next year in 2025, we're getting close. Desperate for Jesus, we gather over 3000 women in the room and then we gather thousands more online. And so if you by yourself need to watch it, or if you need to gather a small group of women in your living room, or if you want to build your women's conference around the Desperate for Jesus conference material, our content, we want you to know that you can register as an individual virtually, but you can also register your group or your church. And then we supply to you um, supportive mechanisms. And what I mean by that is we'll give you the graphics, we'll give you a leader's kit, we'll give you a suggested um uh, conference guide, um, just so that you can create an amazing watch party at your church without having to book the speaker, without having to book the musical guest, without having to provide the programming. You just gather your women and say, we're going to be desperate for Jesus together here. So we are excited about the opportunity that we have to bring desperate for Jesus to you individually into an intimate small group or at your church for your women's conference. So go to uh, dfjconference.com to register and for more information. Again, we are really glad that you spent some time with us. It is always my privilege to welcome you in the room. Um, I know that my mother, having been a pastor's wife for many, many years, um, had a heart because as Lori said over and over again, she knew what it was to be in that lane and to feel alone. She didn't want you to feel alone, but she also wanted you to have information so that you didn't have to figure out things the slow and the hard way. And she wanted you to be equipped for the journey to serve your, your husband, to serve your church, but ultimately to serve the Lord. And like Lori so amazingly said, I want to be obedient. I want to know what you have called me to do. And what we want to do is come alongside and make sure that for whatever calling God has given you, that you are equipped with whatever we can share to do it his way for his glory and for the people of God for their good. So thanks again for joining me. I hope you've been encouraged. Thanks again, Lori Wilhite, for joining us and we'll see you next time.